स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया we will continue our discussion of the french masters especially with reference to robert bresson and uh, yesterday we were discussing pickpocket uh, his most uh, famous and well known work uh, so uh, let's revise the key elements in uh, bresson so bresson bresson sorry uh, who has had a very far reaching influence on directors who followed him uh, as well as uh, directors of the new hollywood period and yesterday we did refer to martin scorsese and paul schrader so key features are one is the strong spiritual uh, element in all his works the moral force in his work works uh, the spareness he reduces uh, the settings the music and uh, of course the dramatic emphasis on acting so there is no melodrama at all the, those are the key features we have to remember um, all these things the spiritual element the spaceness they lead to a certain kind of an emotional force to bresson's works and of course there is the the sense of metonymy um, in a pickpocket there are several close up shots of hands where uh, uh, people are involved in pick pocketing and uh, all that we uh, get to see are close up shots of their hands and this is a recurring motif in most of uh, bresson's works so uh, exchanging looks close ups of hands eyes okay this becomes a, a very uh, repeated feature in bresson's work now talking about a uh, spiritual element most of his works almost all of his works uh, focus on seeking redemption in a hopelessly corrupt world as yesterday we were discussing bresson's works raise moral questions will we be judged and by what law and again bresson is a highly or existentialist in his approach uh, for him the world is essentially an absurdist meaningless place so these are the key features these are the philosophies that we have to remember while discussing uh, bresson and uh, yesterday we had already talked about pickpocket in some detail today we will discuss a man escaped and o has a balthazar a man escaped 1956 is again uh, an extension of bresson's minimalistic style there is a man who is imprisoned for a very petty crime and most of the time he is behind bars in locked up in a very small cell much of the action is a uh, much of the action takes place in a cell and then again we find bresson's theory of the cinematograph non professionals giving de dramatized performances and yet yielding a very unique emotional force to the works do you remember what we meant yesterday by non professionals giving de dramatized performances what was it it just meant that actors were stripped of emotions anyway he uh, he would cast only people who were not trained remember that yes i'm talking to you yes you remember that he would cast people who were not trained actors who were not in the profession of acting and still uh, with those actors also he would make and how you how would you strip people of emotions he would make them re rehearse repeatedly exhaust them wear them off and that would drain them of all their energy and emotions 
and then he would shoot. This was a technique which was also made common by Carl Dreyer. Remember, you were yesterday discussing Paul Schroeder's book, focusing on Ozu, Dreyer, and Bresson. Paul Schroeder has written a classic, a seminal book. The a director of, uh, sorry, the screenwriter for Taxi Driver. He has written a book on Ozu, Dreyer, and Bresson. If you read that, you will understand their uh, uh, their techniques, and some there is something which is very common in these directors. So you can again, uh, uh, if you uh, look at some of the stills from A Man Escaped, you will understand how minimalistic it is. Okay, a man escaped. What is it about? A man trying to escape, and he does escape. A condemned man escapes. And he does escape. So, uh, therefore, you uh, in most of the publicity stills of the film, you see a very tight close up of the actor behind the bars or a rope hanging from the prison wall. Okay, a man escaping, trying to escape, and he is relentless. He does not talk too much, he has made a couple of friends in the prison, but there is not much dialogue. Okay. Concrete images, remember we, when we were discussing Bresson, what did we talk about? His emphasis on images, concrete images. Okay. So, concrete image, a rope hanging down from the prison wall, a very concrete image. Um, prison dramas are uh, of course, quite common. We have a very popular prison drama, Shawshank Redemption, but then we all earlier we had Jacques Baker's The Hole and Jeanne is a song of love which preceded A Man Escaped. All these films along with A Man Escaped, The Hole and A Song of Love uh, act as allegories of human suffering, just like Shawshank Redemption. It is not just about a man in prison is like an allegory that most of us suffer. The world is a prison. Now, O Hazard Balthazar, in English, the English title is just Balthazar, 1966. It follows the life of a donkey, but it is not a singing donkey, it is not the donkey from Shrek. Okay. It is a very spiritual kind of a donkey. Uh, and uh, mm, Bresson traces its life and its death, its life and its birth, its entire life from its birth to its death. And when it is uh, mm, uh, a baby donkey, the do uh, a couple of children in the village, they pour water on its head and what is the indication here? Baptism. Baptism. Okay, so, but the donkey is baptized. Remember, Bresson is a very Christian director okay, and he says that all of us have to go through, I mean it is just not, not fair that only humans uh, deserve a certain kind of ritual. All living beings are equal in Bresson's eyes. And then we have uh, that and we follow the donkey's life, the movie is set the story is set in a French district. The donkey, the, uh, uh, several people change hands, so he is owned by several people during the course of the movie and the world is washed through the donkey's eyes. Now, donkey is a very common, very silly animal for most of us, but in Bresson, he is a philosopher, he is a narrator, he is the narrator of the movie. Okay. And there are many characters in the film. There is a 14 year old girl, she is in love with someone, her parents. So, there are several people in the, there is a ringmaster, the donkey is also owned uh, for a couple of months by a circus owner and he trains the donkey to be a specialist in mathematics. He starts solving multiplication tables etcetera okay, and he becomes a star donkey. So, all sorts of things happen to Balthazar. But uh, and through the donkey's eyes, what does he see? A village full of weak, flawed, and petty people. So that's Bresson's take on humanity. That this is what people are all about. 
So, uh, having a donkey is just uh, a metaphor, it is the director looking very objectively at humankind. Okay, so, what Bluesaw seems to suggest is that we are all Balthazars, we all suffer okay, and the world will stay the way it is. Okay, what the, the basic idea is, no one is going to change for you. When Balthazar is beaten to death, the village idiot, the village drunk, a misfit treats and uh, uh, nurses it back to health. Okay, so, there is something, there is, there is something redeeming even in the most hopeless of mankind, of, of people, the village drunk, the local drunk, whom everyone has uh, written off. Okay. Um, when he die, when, when the donkey dies, it goes back among a herd of sheep and dies peacefully. Okay, there is no melodrama, there is no loud music, Bresau does not ask us to weep at Balthazar's death. The donkey just dies very peacefully, their own business of herd of sheep, whatever they are doing, they continue, no one is affected. What is Bresau telling us? Yes, donkeys do not make a difference, anyone's death does not make a difference, the world goes on. Okay. Uh, do you remember that famous painting, Fall of Icarus, what is it about? Ah, yeah, that is a story, but there is a painting as well by Bigel, okay. I think it is a Dutch painter. What happens in the uh, fall of Icarus. Icarus has been given wings of wax and he is escaping to uh, his freedom, but then because he has been given uh, wings by his father, they are not his natural wings remember, they are wings of wax. He is overconfident, full of joy, so he starts uh, flying higher and higher and reaches very close to the sun and then what happens when you are when you are wearing wings of wax and you are so close to me, melt and meets his death. So, falls uh, uh, from uh, his heights and splashes in the water, dies. Okay, there is a painting by Bigel depicting this sequence, this scene, Icarus drowning to his death, the world passes him by. Okay. What does it mean? Nobody is death, however high and mighty you might be, it does not matter, that is Bresson's philosophy. Okay. Uh, whatever may be our dreams, hopes, ambitions and plans, after all, uh, you know, after everything, we are going to be treated by the world the way it wants to treat us, nothing is going to change. Any comments? Azar knows Balthazar, so would you like to add something to it? The girl, the love story that runs through the movie? Yes, yesterday I was watching Pickpocket. Wow. And, uh, yes? I was, I was thinking the different ways he, use, he uses the camera to portray loneliness. Like yeah. in Pickpocket, it is all static camera mostly, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, small spaces, mm -hmm. and uh, but it's the opposite in Ozad Balthazar. There are the frame is it covers more space. Okay. Uh, so like there are two ways to portray okay. lo loneliness. Use, uh, loneliness. Uh, see, a Balthazar after all is a donkey. The world is his home, and uh, in a brace, in pickpocket, the man is confined. Uh, by his own loneliness. Therefore, places are all, even his little room surrounded with books is almost like a prison. Yeah. And if you compare his, his room, Michelle's room in pickpocket with the man who is condemned in a man escaped in prison, okay, they are quite alike, they are not much of a difference. What he is trying to tell us is more or less all of us are in prison. It is in death that we find redemption of freedom.
this highly philosophical as we have been talking about existentialist, the world is absurd, meaningless, whatever we do is meaningless. Okay. So, that is the idea that is recurring in his films. I am going to read you, uh, this is a book, the films in my life and who is this? Francois Truffaut. Okay. Uh, Truffaut was one of the critics for uh, Cahiers du Cinema. Remember that? Andre Bezon, Cahiers du Cinema. So, Truffaut was a writer, a critic. He had also written a, an essay. Yesterday, we were talking about a certain quality of, a certain tendency of French cinema. Hmm? I am just reading, because he was a critic also. And uh, uh, Truffaut says of Bresson, in my opinion, um, a man escaped is not only Bresson's most beautiful film, but also the most important French film of the past 10 years. This essay was written uh, in 1956. So, before I wrote the sentence, I listed on a piece of paper and listened to this. All the films that, I, uh, that have been made by Renoir, Max Ophels, Cocteau, Jacques Tati, Astruc, Becker, Clouseau, and Claire since 1946. So, I made a list of all these films and I think the A Man Escaped is the most beautiful film. Now, I regret that I wrote a few months ago, Bresson's theories are always fascinating, but they are so personal that they fit only him. The future existence of a Bresson school, Bresson school in inverted commas would shake even his most optimistic observers. A conception of cinema that is so theoretical, mathematical, musical and above all ascetic. So, that is one word, one adjective commonly applied to Bresson's cinema, ascetic <coughs> could, no, uh, could not give rise to a general insight. Today, I must disavow those sentences. A man escape seems to me to reduce to nothing a certain number of accepted ideas that governed filmmaking all the way from script writing to direction. In many way films nowadays, we find what is commonly called a touch of bravura or bravura. What that means is that the filmmaker was thought to be courageous, that he tried to surpass himself in one or two scenes. By this token, a man escaped, which is a stubborn film about stubbornness made by a stubborn native of the Overgan is the first movie of utter bravura. Let us try to see how it differs from all the others we have seen over the years. So, what he is saying in other words is, it is uh, many, uh, 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 um, uh, very often we describe directors as a brave director, right. It is a he is a, uh, he overwhelms you with his daring. Okay. <coughs> uh, Bresson in A Man Escaped emerges as the most daring of all directors. Okay. It is a very courageous movie, it is a very bold movie. Why? Because of its ascetic style. So, that is what, what is uh, your takeaway should be about or on Bresson. Most ascetic also innovative and courageous style, not in terms of boldness or depiction, uh, depicting something very scandalous on his screen, but the way he told his stories. Um, any questions? Please give it a thought for a few moments and then we will skip to other area. Important director Orson Welles and from the French masters, now we are in Hollywood, Orson Welles and his, which movie? Citizen Kane. Okay. This is something that we have been talking about quite frequently. We also watched a montage sequence from Citizen Kane a few uh, days back. So, Citizen Kane 1941 and it was produced by Mercury and RKO Pictures. This is very important. You should know the names of all the studios. So, uh, it starred many people, but uh, now we can easily recognize Orson Welles and Joseph Cotton. 
directed by Orson Welles. It is often considered as the canonical text. Now, I want you to take a few moments and think of canon. What is a canon? Not a canon ball, but canonical text. So, citizen Kane as a canonical text and my question to you is what is a canon and if you have to make your canon then what would be a part of your canonical text in cinema do not give me a list of books. Please take 2 minutes to make your canon canonical list. First you have to tell me what is a canon and then give me a list of canonical films according to you. Please work, you can work in uh, small groups or pairs, Paleri and Azar, please get together, look at each other. Vedan, join someone, hop, hop over. What is a canon? I want a working definition of a canon and I want a list of at least 5 canonical films according to you. You have given me once upon a time your favorite films. So, your fa favorite films need not be a part of any canon. All right, time up at the back. What is a canon? You three, the little girl in white, she will tell us what is a canon. Okay. Certain theory, certain set of rules conforms to a certain set of rules. Okay. Anyone else? You have something to say? Prototypical. Okay. Start a series of new trends and be followed by other makers. Okay, so something uh, innovative. innovative. Yeah, a benchmark. Yes. Pulp fiction, would you call it a canonical text? Vedan, do you have your list? Your group? We don't have any list. Let us have a list. Canonical texts according to you people. Matrix maybe. Okay, matrix. <coughs> Fine. Uh, uh, okay, Paleri and Azar and your friend, what do you have to say about canon and your list? It is like the most. Uh, and okay. also the most influential in cinema. Oh, fine, okay. Give me your list. I think that will clear. Uh, okay. Birth of a Nation. Okay. Battleship for Tonkin. Okay. Uh, Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. Vertigo. Mm -hmm. Then a dry of films, 400 Ghosts, Breathless, Hiroshima, Anima. Okay. 
by the French masters, new wave filmmakers, okay. Canonical texts, yes. Eight and a half. Eight and a half. Fellini. Okay. Here, what is a canon? Iruvar. Shole Iruvar, yes. Think of something else. More international. Let me just define canon for you. All of you have some idea, but um, the dictionary defines a canon as a generally accepted rule, a standard or principle by which th something is judged. Okay? So, there are, so someone said rules and principles here. So, a list of books or other works that are generally accepted as the genuine work of a particular writer or as being important. Okay? So, important texts. Of course, dictionaries are giving us the word books. Okay, books are canonical, but we can even stretch the definition a little bit and say texts are canonical and a set of films which are important because they adhere to certain standards and certain principles, as they rightly pointed out. Okay. Uh, canon became an important term in Christian theological discourse in 1890 with the establishment of the Hebrew biblical canon. And whatever falls outside canon are apocryphal and non authentic. So, these are the words you should remember. Canon authenticates, canon validates. Now, canon as a theory or as a uh, term is a, a much contested like every theory and it has there has to be a some contest you cannot blindly accept any concept or term or theory. So, canon is a much contested much debated term who decides okay? he may say mat matrix you may say shole, okay? but who decides is there a touch of subjectivity? Yes. If you look at now seminal film critics, and I can only talk about the most well known ones. Okay. So, uh, uh, there is Pollen Keel. Are you aware of Pollen Keel? Okay. Pollen Keel from Hollywood was a critic who would tell us what to watch, and her views were so important that she could uh, make or mar careers, actors, directors, screenwriters, etcetera, etcetera. Okay. Most people who would read uh, uh, at least uh, film magazines or reviews, they would go by her word. So, that is, yeah. and sh people like Pauline Keel had the authority to create a list of canon, canonical texts. Uh, more accessible, Roger Ebert, okay, he always tells you what to watch. 100 best movies. Absolutely, volume 1, volume 2, great movies, Roger Abbott. Okay, there are, and in each volume, there are 100 movies. So, Rob, Ro, Roger Abbott telling us what to watch. Okay, there is a book called 1001 Movies to Watch Before You Die. That means, do not dare die <laughs> before watching these movies. So, every once in a while, you get a list of or uh, uh, you know a collection of uh, uh, such books where you are told what to what to watch now um, here you can please focus on this what is it called the greatest movies ever the greatest movies ever what is this book doing and creating a set of canonical texts okay the greatest movie so this is a canon okay and the work, the book is written by people who are um, considered authority on film writing. Um, the Little Black Book 
of movies. There is a similar uh, book floating around somewhere, the little black book of uh, books also, but here I am showing you the little black book of movies. Which movie is this from? Silence, Silence of the Lamb, a canonical text. Okay. So, what are we doing here now? We are looking and uh, the tagline is over a century of the greatest films, comma, stars, comma, scenes and speeches and events that rock the movie world. Okay. So, they are telling us these are the movies that you should be watching and you will have camp here, you will have cult here, okay. but they are all part of a certain canon. So, canons are those which adhere to certain principles and which are considered authentic by whatever is standard. In literature for example, it is inconceivable for any anthology to omit Shakespeare or Homer or Tolstoy, if they are giving you a list of 101 books to read before you die and how can you not have Shakespeare, right? So, Shakespeare becomes a canon, okay. Iliad and Odyssey, you have to read, otherwise you are not educated enough. James Joyce's Ulysses, you have to read, okay, if you want to be taken seriously by a certain group of people, canonical literature. Tolstoy, of course, Tolstoy is uh, a great entertainer also, a great storyteller, so easy to read. Anna Karenina, War and Peace, wonderful books, part of a canon. For example, in, in the 18th century, you had someone like Samuel Johnson, Dr. Samuel Johnson, who included 52 writers who constitute the canon of English verse and it was called lives of the most eminent poets. So, what was Johnson doing? Creating a canon, which was one of the foremost attempts in creating a canon. Okay. So, uh, remembrance of things past, okay, by who? By Prue. Hmm? Divine comedy by Dante, Paradise Lost by Milton and Moby Dick by Herman Melville and all kinds of literary anthologies and again film anthologies. There are certain movies, so they rightly mention a list of movies which are part of the canon. There cannot be any anthology of cinema without the mention of birth of a nation, uh, the, uh, the, the trilogy uh, 400 blows and breathless eight and a half. What else did you mention? Uh, Battleship Potemkin, Gone with the Wind, Citizen Kane, uh, perhaps Ben Hur. Yeah. So uh, that these are the movies. Contemporary. I mean, I'm by contemporary. Contemporary is a very loose word. Uh, so you can even go back to, to the seventies. Contemporary. Okay. So if something which happened during the last forty to fifty years. So canon. If you look at the contemporary canon, let us not go back to intolerance and birth of a nation and uh, um, uh, gone with the wind. If you look at the movies made during the 30, 40 years, last 30, 40 years, what will you think? <laughs> Raging Bull, Scorsese, okay, you will th definitely think of Rage, Scorsese's Raging Bull, not necessarily Gangs of New York. Right, so Raging Bull has become a canon for uh, a, a, a set of uh, particular reasons. Some principles that he, that a director or filmmaker has to adhere to. Matrix, yes, a part of contemporary. Yes, Godfather, of course, it goes without saying. Godfather is a very strong uh, presence in any. Uh, anthology of cinema. Okay. Uh, uh, Brandy Palmer's Scarface, yes it is, okay. uh, Chinatown, Polanski's, part of a canon. Uh, well, Die Hard is a different kind of a film. I can see a lot of smiles here, when you say Die Hard, Terminator, Judgment 2, yeah, it is a different kind of a canon, but not necessarily, I do not think that they will find a, their way into Roger Ebert's hundred movie that you must watch before you die. I doubt it. 
Uh, yes, I the would. Handel George. Yes, definitely, definitely, City of God. It has to be a part of any canon. If a book, a recent book comes out, then I am very sure it will be uh, uh, inclusive of City of God. Groundhog Day is a contemporary classic. Yeah, can you think of anything more? Any Ashwa. any other movie? Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs. What is that? Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs. Okay, I am. We are uh, more interested in Pulp Fiction. Okay, so Pulp Fiction is a canonical text which will always be a part of any cinema anthology. Reservoir Dogs may may not be. Okay, it doesn't have. I think so. Yes, Aliens would be a bit. Jaws. Jaws was first of a kind. Um, but when you create a canon, are you inherently saying that some kinds of movies are superior? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So, Canons, therefore, I am saying are interesting to analyze as they dictate you. The word is dictate. They are telling you what to watch and what to teach. If Aisha does not teach Citizen Kane, then there will be a question mark on teaching. Okay. How dare you call yourself and call your course uh, film theory and practice when you did not even touch upon Citizen Kane or Godard or Truffaut. Okay. So, it dictates you. So, I cannot, however much. I may love reservoir dogs, <laughs> okay, but I, uh, when you are look, uh, looking at a 40 hours course, then you have to sacrifice reservoir dogs, but you cannot dare to sacrifice the godfather, okay, citizen Kane, Pulp Fiction, okay, the, they become the canon, Chinatown. I was once uh, uh, teaching a it was a sub module in film theory and practice. I uh, very often I change uh, uh, the uh, you know syllabus. So, there was a time when I was teaching city and cinema, how city is expressed in cinema and which movies do you think I would have looked at? Paris, Texas, Paris, Paris Jatem, yeah anthology. Good, very nice. It gives you Paris in its um, various manifestations, right? New York anthology that yeah, the movie yesterday I was talking about Coppola, uh, Woody Allen, and uh, Martin Scorsese's Life Lessons. Okay, Manhattan again by Woody Allen. Manhattan is a beautiful depiction of a, a certain part of New York. There are certain can if you are looking at a module like city cinema and you do you are teaching a set of movies like Parija theme like uh, uh, New York stories, then why not Chinatown? That is a question, that is a very valid question. Wim Wenders Paris, Texas. Okay. That is another very important movie if you want to look at sit how cities and spaces are reflected in cinema. Um, Wings of Desire again, a German movie by Wim Wenders. Okay, watch the, the watch those movies. Wings of Desire. There was a, a movie, Hollywood movie called City of Angels, not City of God. City of Angels, Nicolas Cage and Meg Ryan. Okay, which is a remade version of Wings of Desire by Wim Wenders. Okay, so Canon. Canon tells you what to teach and what to read and what to watch. So, you are, you are absolutely right. Who creates it and do you need to adhere to it? Yes, for some reason, if you call yourself uh, a student of literature, there is no way that you can ignore Shakespeare and Dante. If you call yourself a student of cinema, there is no way you can ignore uh, uh, D. W. Griffiths and Lumiere Brothers. Okay, so, they are part of your canon. Now, Citizen Kane was marketed as the classic story of power and the press, how newsprint gives you power, media lends power and has all uh, often been called or hailed as the greatest film of all time, okay, canon.
there is no list of greatest all time movies, which is ever completed without the mention of Citizen Kane. And let me tell you, Citizen Kane was not a, a blockbuster, it was not a mega hit, it was not a money spinner, whose life was it based on? A media magnet, a media magnet, William Randolph Hearst, William Randolph Hearst and it was based on his life and he did William Randolph Hearst did his best to see that the movie does not last in theatres and he had the power, he had the muscle, he could do that. And then of course, the narrative which was way too complicated for those times and if you watch, how many of you have seriously watched Citizen Kane? That is good, that is very impressive. Okay, Azar, have you? Okay. Please do watch it and I want you to pay attention to the first 10 minutes when you are taken across what Xanadu. Okay. So, as Charles Foster Kane, the protagonist, uh, he is dying, he is on his deathbed and uh, we are taken through his estate and it is called Xanadu. And while we are uh, uh, you know admiring uh, the luxuries of Xanadu. Okay, there are lots of things happening there. Okay, watch it. Watch the way in which uh, um, Orson Welles demolishes all the traditional narrative structures. And how does he do it? It's he is not being very realistic. In in fact, it's very subjective camera movement. Okay, the way he treated, treats uh, the spaces is extremely subjective. For instance, there is a particular um, uh, light okay, in the middle of a room and the light stays in one corner of, uh, of the screen, whereas you are treated to, uh, uh, to his golf courses, to his gondolas, to his zoos. He owns animals right? on uh, all a part of his uh, Zanadu estate, while the same light, you know a bulb hangs in the middle of the screen. So, golf course, I mean the, <laughs> the bulb cannot be in the middle of a golf course right? or in the middle of a swimming pool. What is he trying to tell you? Very interesting, you know there is no fixed answer to that. Okay. So, often termed or often declared the best movie of all part. So, it is a very strong uh, of all time. So, it is a very strong part of any film canon. And sight and sound, what is sight and sound? It is a film magazine, very scholarly magazine. So, it is not one of those yellow uh, rags, which talks about um, uh, you know gossip, gossip about, uh, about actors and their businesses, but it is a, a very serious, very academic kind of a journal. It is not a journal, it is a magazine, but it has the respectability of a journal, academic journal. So, Sight and Sound has rated it four times as the best movie ever made, okay, which is a huge praise by any standard. Any comments you would like to make on Canon, on Citizen Kane, any questions? In last year's fall, in which magazine? Sight and Sound? Okay, so, Sight and Sound keeps on conducting these polls, which are very important. They do tell us what to watch, which is the best movie ever. And you know why? You know, because now there is a tendency to look at the body of work by a director and Hitchcock any day will score over Orson Welles. Because how many of you remember any other movie by, uh, by Orson Welles? apart from Citizen Kane. But Hitchcock, even in your sleep you can mention at least five films, is not it true? Yeah, North by Northwest, Rear Window, uh, um, that nice movie with Cary Grant and Grace Kelly in French Riviera, To Catch a Thief, okay, To Catch a Thief, notorious, it is a spy movie, it is a thriller, 
um, strangers on a train, psycho of course, and then vertigo. But it is but Orson Welles, touch of evil, yeah, great movie, but not a phenomenal success. Magnificent Ambersons, again a magnificent movie, but not a success at all. Highly innovative, the way he told his narratives. Chimes at Midnight, which was a retelling of which story? Chimes at Midnight. Macbeth, yeah. That is Orson Welles take on Shakespeare's Macbeth. So, um, he has made movies, which are known basically to film scholars and uh, film cine enthusiasts, but Hitchcock is well known. So, naturally, yeah, I am very sure 20 years from today, Pulp Fiction will be the most admired film of all time. Why not? And where did uh, Godfather stand here in this list? I do not think it is uh, in the Cycle top 10, I do not think That is very strange. That is very strange. What do you remember other titles? Because whatever uh, list? Tokyo Story. Uh, Tokyo Story. O Ozu was second. Ozu. Okay. So, look so, how things change, how canons change. Now, if Tokyo Story by Ozu occupies the second place, then it is very interesting. And um, who was it? Uh, Orson Welles himself. He was no admirer, and I am saying no admirer of uh, these people the fr like the French masters or uh, the Italian neorealists neo and the Japanese greats. He said that I absolutely do not understand what they make, and there he said there is a school of boredom okay, to which these films belong. And most of the time, these people come to me. Uh, and he cited Kair du Cinema. You remember we have been talking about it. And he said, those journalists come to me and start asking very high, high bro questions and expect me to give high bro answers. I can't discuss that. I mean, they want to want me to talk about cinema as an art. I mean, what the hell is that? <laughs> okay. He says, I have I have absolutely no clue about what it means. But I do give interviews to those people because they like me so much. I can't say no to that's his. So Wells as a critic, he had absolutely uh, no regards for the Japanese master, the Ozus and the Fellinis and all those people of the world. Okay, he called them boring down there. So you must read his biography. It's very interesting. Uh, so thank you so much. We will meet tomorrow and continue with Citizen Kane.